وسدد نبينا الهادي محمد في روحه عزم عظيم في الهمة الكبرى تجسد يغشى الوضى من غير خوف وحنين والأحزاب تشد في روحه عزم عظيم في الهمة الكبرى تجسد يغشى الوضى من غير خوف وحنين والأحزاب تشد القائد أعلى المسدد نبينا الهادي محمد في روحه عزم عظيم في الهمة الكبرى إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله Today, insha'Allah ta'ala, although there are many absentees due to safar, traveling, regardless, we shall have a lesson, insha'Allah ta'ala, and this lesson will be the continuation of the verses from Surat Al-An'am, from 151 to 153. We initiate by saying, that Islam today is the fastest growing religion in the world. There are approximately 1.8 billion Muslims, making it the second largest religion currently on this existence, after obviously what religion? Christianity. Christianity. But what we must understand is that Islam is a complete way of life. It is not a Saturday religion, nor is Islam a Sunday religion, nor does Islam take after a person as in the case of Christianity, it takes after whom? Isa alayhi salam known by the name of Jesus or Marxism takes after whom? Karl Marx. Karl Marx or Buddhism takes after whom? Buddha, is that his name? Gautama Buddha, correct? Nor does Islam take after a tribe like Judaism, the tribe of Judah or Hinduism, the tribe of the Hindus, the Hindu tribe. Islam is completely different. It is submission and surrender of one's will to the only will worthy of worship, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why Islam is the only religion the only deen that places the greatest stress, the greatest emphasis on divine unity, on Tawheed. Compromising not with anything that goes against this word of salvation. No matter how minute this compromise may be, if you do not perfect Tawheed 100%, you are committing shirk. So if you worship Allah on 99.9999% on Tawheed and that little minute 0.0111% that is to other than Allah, you have committed shirk. And you are a mushrik, a kafir, abiding eternally in damnation. See the importance of Tawheed? This message, the full significance of this message 
should never ever escape our minds. Ever. This is why it is extremely important, imperative, that we understand the meaning of worshipping Allah alone. Not in accordance to our forefathers. Not in accordance to our madhahib. Not in accordance of our school of thoughts. Or this person or that person. No, in accordance of the only one that taught Islam with full purity. Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Islam is unlike all other previous revealed religions in one crucial aspect besides Tawheed. All of them came with something called an expiry date. You know when you buy milk as when, what do you do with it? You drink it. What if that milk, you leave it in the fridge and you forget it? One week later you go back to the fridge and you want to drink that milk, but that milk has expired. Can you still drink it? Can you still drink it? You can, yes. And that's what you're saying. But what would happen to you? You become healthy? It can cause you sickness. Poisoning. It can detriment your health. So what do you do? You abandon it. You forsake it. You throw it away. <coughs> so likewise, all previous revealed religions have come with an expiry date. Except Islam. There is no expiry date on Islam. For indeed, the guidance from the Almighty Allah has been definitely completed. The deen of Islam has been perfected. There will be no more new message, no new messenger, no new prophet, no new sharia, ah, no new command. Even Isa alayhi salam when he comes down as a major son of the hour, does he come with a new religion? Absolutely not. He follows Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib ibn Hashim ibn Abdi Munaf al Qurashi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is Islam. The path of Islam, the straight path, has been laid down for us. So what is our duty? We are not allowed to touch this path. In the sense where we add something to it, or we delete something from it, or we try to discover new paths other than the path of La ilaha illallah. Our duty is to follow unquestionably, unconditionally, strictly the path that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has left for us on the tongue and the example of the greatest examples, our beloved teacher Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Him being the seal of prophets, the last of messengers, clearly indicates, clearly implies that all previous religions have been declared corroded by their followers by Allah. Allah has declared all previous religions as corroded religions, corroded paths. Thus Allah has abrogated them all. He has what? You can eat? He has what? What does abrogated mean? What does abrogated mean when we say Allah has abrogated them all? What's abrogation here? Yes. That means there is an abrogator. For something to be abrogated, there must be a abrogator. What's the abrogator? Islam. And this is clearly mentioned in Surat Al 
Ali Amran verse 19 in the Dina Islam clear proof explicit truly the deen the religion with Allah is Islam alaykasalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh no need for interpretation it is clear as light indeed truly verily surely the deen with Allah ta'ala in other words the only deen accepted is Islam and in Surah Al-Ma'idah verse number three Allah ta'ala says again وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينًا And I have chosen for you Islam to be your way of life, religion, deen. And he actually says to us in Al-Ali Amran again, verse 102, that if you want to die, you can die. Allah is talking to us now, communicating to us. If you want to die, Mika'id, you can die, but how? How can you die? On what state did he say to us, die on? Ali Amran, 102. On what state did he say, you want to die, no problem, die, but? As? As Muslims. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, ittaku allaha haqqa tuqatihi, wa la tamutunna illa. Look at this exemption here. Illa, except, wa antum muslimun. You know, Allah is saying, fear him, fear Allah, as he ought to be feared, as he should be feared. Hakkul fi, the reality of fearing him in reality. Genuine fear. But, do not die, he says. Except, while you are a Muslim. So, do you not feel sorry for those that do die, but not as Muslims? You know, Allah is warning us explicitly. You can die whenever you want, whenever you want, but be very careful. Don't come to me on a day of resurrection, on a day of retribution, on a day of resent, on a day of grief, with a religion other than La ilaha illallah. And this is mentioned in Ali Amran, verse 85. وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِي غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْهِ وَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الْخَاصِرِ Whoever comes on a day of resurrection with a religion other than Islam, it will never ever be accepted, Allah says. And not only that, He will not let you go. Like, you know, you come with Christianity or Buddhism or Hare Krishna or the orange people or the purple people or the white people or the star, the moon and so forth people. He won't let them just go free. No. He says that they will be among the losers. Losers in what, Nazvi? Losers in the Losers of the And to where? Would they go free underneath a tree where there's beautiful shade, cold water? Do you give them a fountain? Where do they go? Hellfire. So you come on the day of resurrection, Allah is saying, with another religion other than Tawheed, you will be in the abyss of damnation. The abyss of chastisement, tormentation. Naru Jahannam. This is the conclusion for all those that do not worship Allah upon Tawheed. And we know that our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was given a sermon, one of the first sermons in Mecca, when he was calling his pagan tribes from association and shirk to the light of Islam, he said to them, by Allah, other than whom there is no deity worthy of worship. I am Rasulullah, O people, my people. I am a messenger of Allah to you in particular, I said, but to all people in general. And then he said, surely you will die as easy as you sleep. And surely you will be resurrected 
as easy as you awaken from sleep and then you will be recompensed on account of everything that you did earning good for good and what other than good does good equal? Good equals what? Bad? Does good equal bad? Good equals good. So good in this dunya, you will equal in the hereafter what? Good. Earning good, he said, for good, and bad for bad. So if you're bad in this dunya, it's going to equal on the day of resurrection what? Good? Naturally bad. That's what our rationality teaches us. Our logic. And the hadith said this to us. Earning good for good and bad for bad. And then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then it will be Eva Jahannam, hellfire for eternity and paradise for eternity. Either hellfire for eternity or paradise for eternity. SubhanAllah. Is it not clear, my beloved brothers and sisters? Do we need a translator? This narration is extremely explicit, conspicuous, like light, easy to understand. For indeed, in this life, you are, if you are a good person, not good in the sense of, you know, good behavior to others only, giving charity only. Good in what? Zak. Good in what? Ya yeah, Zaki. Worshipping Allah. Worshipping Allah on what? Many people worship Allah. On? Tawheed. This is the good that it refers to in this hadith. Good upon Tawheed, Muwahideen. And bad means he? Shirk. Because anything lesser than Shirk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may forgive. But shirk is an unforgivable, noxious, evil sin. And there will be no forgiveness for that. And this brings us to the verse that we are discussing today. This is the path of Islam, my beloved brothers and sisters. And in verse, Al-An'am, verse 153, Allah Ta'ala says, وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاتِي مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا الصُّبْلِ فَتَفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِ ذَلِكُمْ وَصَّاكُمْ بِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّكُونَ زَكَ اللَّهُ خَيْرٍ يَمِكَئِ This is my path, he says. So follow it. And do not follow the other paths. For they will separate you, take you away, remove you from his path. Whose path is that? From Allah's path. This he has commanded. Why? In order that you may achieve taqwa. What's taqwa in English? Who can tell me what taqwa in English is? Very good. That's a very good definition which we have to include in the dictionary, inshallah. Being aware, vigilant, alert of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another meaning, because you know in the Arabic language, there are words which is almost impossible to translate into English. This is why we say the interpretation of the meaning of the Quran, but not the, the, not the translation. Because it is impossible to translate the Quran. But you can interpret the meaning of the Quran. Another word for taqwa? لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّكُمْ That you may have fear. Piety, righteousness, Allah consciousness, and the list goes on. So Allah Ta'ala has given us these Ten Commandments so we can be better people, more righteous, more pious, better to each other, better in this dunya and the next dunya. Yeah. Now, in reiteration of this beautiful verse, an authentic narration was collected by Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Hanbal and others that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam one day drew a straight line onto the ground 
a straight line. It's more straighter than this. And then he said, this is the straight path of Allah. Listen carefully. And then he drew what? Circles or triangular curves or what did he do? He? Other lines, curves to the right, to the left. Many, many others. Right? Like zigzags, because shaitan is a zigzag, idiotic, evil, devilish one. And he said, these lines are the other paths. And at the start of each path, there is a shaitan, a devil, calling people to follow his path. And then he recited the verse, Rasulullah, وَأَنَّ هَذَا سِرَاتِي to the end of it. Now Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, who is the narrator of this narration, he was asked, Ya Abdullah, what is this straight path of Rasulullah they was talking about? He said, it is the path that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left us on. Listen carefully to this. Left us on. Who? Your father or your mother or a Shafi'i or Ahmad or Malik or who? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is the path that Rasulullah left us on. And then he said, there are other lines as well to the right and to the left. Is Abdullah saying this, explaining this hadith to a companion of his. And there are other lines to the right and to the left. But on each line there are men, he said. Men. Because in the devilish meanings Allah says in the Quran shayatinul ins wal jinn men can be devils as well women can be devils as well as jinn can be devils of it amongst them there are female and male jinn devils as there is in the human race male and female human devils so he said on each one there is men or there are men every time someone passes by they call them Tafaddalu ahlan wa sahlan. Come, follow my way. And then he said, Whoever follows these paths ends up in Jahannam, in hellfire. But whoever follows this path ends up in Jannah. Saying, Abdullah said, Its beginning and its end is what, Ya Muhammad? The straight path. Its beginning and its end is what? Straight, huh? That's true. But its beginning and its end is what? Huh? <coughs> it starts with J. Jannah. Its beginning and its end is Jannah. So as long as you don't divert to any of these paths, you will all ultimately go where, Nasri? Is it hard? To Jannah. So in reality, if you look at the situation, have we not been given a straight path? It is not confusing or complicating. It is extremely easy to understand in every and any act of worship. When we want to worship Allah, we must make sure that this act is in accordance to whom? To Rasulullah Wasallam. Simple. If he did this act, what do we do? We do it. If he did not, what do we do? We stay away, even though my teacher or my madhab or my this or my that or my maulana knows or thinks that it's acceptable. Did he do it? Yes, okay, I do it. Did he not do it? No, but it's better. You are a liar. The better is in what he left us on, not in what you think. The better is in call Allahu and call Rasulullah, not call Shaykh Ahmad. Oh, Sheikh Rifai, oh, Al Qudjani, oh, Sheikh Kada, oh, Kada, no. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is salvation. This is the path that we are commanded to follow. And there are hundreds of verses, hundreds of hadith, all authentic, that mention the importance of adhering to no other than this path. So, wallahi, brothers and sisters, it is simple. It is not hard. 
He wants salvation. He has left us on salvation. It is our duty to say, سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا غَفْرَانَكَ رَبَّنَا وَإِلَيْكَ الْمَصِيرِ We hear, we obey. Oh Allah, forgive us our past, and to you we shall return. When you know something is from Rasulullah, even if it goes against your culture, your madhab, your maulana, your father, your mother, you say, I push all these away and I follow one path, the straight path of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah Ta'ala has blessed us all. How has He blessed us? By creating us in such a favored nation. Not only as Muslims, my brothers and sisters, but He has create us, created us in the best nations ever. The nation of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This in itself is a great blessing. And the early Muslims, they understood what this meant. They understood this straight path. This is why they moved from success to success, not to failure. The early Muslims, understanding the meaning of this path, they moved from what? Success to success until they attained, achieved the highest peak of glory, of successfulness. Wallahi, for generations, they ruled on this earth. And with such strength, no existing power had the courage, had the guts to even raise an eyebrow at them. And if anyone dared to do so, Wallahi, they will be annihilated obliterated, eradicated, destroyed. Why? Why, Azwan? Why did no one have the guts to touch them? Why did no one confront them or challenge them? Why? Because they believe in this path. They believed in Islam. They knew that honor. Honor, my greatness, Izzah, power can only be in strictly adhering to no other than the path of Rasulullah sallallahu And look at Umar ibn Khattab. And I'm pretty sure you all know this great, powerful, courageous warrior. Just upon the name Umar in the olden days, the pagans when they heard the name Umar, Wallahi, it almost caused an earthquake. They would break, buckle and shake. The pagans, they felt an atmosphere of awe surrounding them. When they heard the name who? Umar ibn Khattab. Why? Because he was muscular? No! He was hairy and scary? No, he was bald. He had no hair. He lost all his hair, Umar. Why? Because he exemplified his honor, power, strength, Greatness, stability, firmness. He had an uncompromising, unwavering stance to what? To the path of Islam. The path of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because when he entered Islam, embraced Islam, he thought that he can rule the earth. Bi'idnillahi ta'ala. Meaning, khalas, no one can touch me. My security is from Allah ta'ala. You know, when in the early days of Islam, Sharif, they used to have something called the years of secrecy. You know, they were doing preaching. It was called the years of what? Secrecy. They were preaching Islam, but they were scared of whom? The pagan oppression, yes, Muhammad. So they kept in secret for how many years approximately? Five or four. Which is? Three years is correct. One day, the minute, subhanAllah, look at this man. The minute that they, he embraced Islam, Umar ibn Khattab, the first session of the secret sessions, he was sitting down. He said, Ya Rasulullah, are we not right? Is Islam not the correct path? Is it not the path of straightness? This path that you have told us to adhere? Rasulullah said, yes, it is, Ya Umar. Are they not run, he said? Who are they? The kufr, the shirk, is that not run? The evil, the filth, the disgust, the putrid stench that they live in and with 
and dwell in. Is that not wrong? Is that not the path of the devils? In other words, he said, yes, ya Umar. Look at this statement. Then why are we hiding? Is not Allah on our side? Why are we hiding? This is, this is Umar talking to who? The messenger of Allah. And Rasulullah said to him, Umar, what do you think we should do? See, he's actually consulting. Allahu Akbar. Because I think, I believe, my opinion is that we leave this secrecy, this inconspicuousness, go outside, raise our arms up high, calling Allahu Akbar. So everyone can see us and go around the Kaaba. Did they do that? Did Rasulullah adhere to this advice? They did exactly as Umar said, and not one pagan dared to do anything about it. And that was when they released themselves from concealment into, into explicit da'wah, the proclamation of La ilaha illallah in the open began. Another example of his great, powerful, courageous ability, when they were going to Medina, the Muslims, they the majority migrated in a state of secrecy. Did Umar migrate hidden underneath a veil, underneath niqab, underneath something? No. What did he do, Nazvi? You've heard this before, haven't you? You sure? What did he do? He announced, we're getting there, inshallah, Muhammad. He armed himself with a sword, with his armor, he done tawaf around the Kaaba, he prayed behind the Abrahamic station, and then he stood firm and strong with full stability. He is a Muslim. What's he going to be scared of? He dies, alhamdulillah. He gets incarcerated, alhamdulillah. He gets tortured, alhamdulillah. What can happen to him? And then he proclaimed out to her, the chiefs of the pagans, not to the Joe Blow who cannot move in the room, no. He portrayed, he proclaimed, propagated to all the chiefs of the pagans, I am now migrating to where? To Medina. Whoever wants his mother bereaved, make her bereaved. Whoever wants his wife to be a widow. Whoever wants his children to be orphans, follow me, he said to them, behind this wadi, behind the valley. Was he scared? Are you scared, Dasvi? Would you be scared? Fuck, you know, consider yourself today. This is, you know, we can put this into our sort of current affairs. You got the kafara that are scrutinizing us, we've got a major stigma out there. Major. They want to silence us. They want to try to extinguish the light of Allah. And Allah told us this. Like severe so hatred has come from their mouths, from their heart. Do we get scared and sit back and relax and not talk about Islam? Not talk about Tawheed? What would you do? You're in the middle of Hyde Park in England, the UK. What would you do? You see a bunch of policemen standing around you, just looking at you, yeah, okay, go on, go on. Then you see other black, dark cars with black suits and black glasses come out, and they're pointing towards you. What would you do? Stop doing that one? You what? You would hope not. You would hope not. You know what you say, Nazi? A'udhu billah that I stop doing da'wah. The day I stop doing da'wah is when I die. That's the response. Look at Shaykh al-Islam. Don't forget the statement, the golden statement of his. What can my enemies do to me, remember? What are you scared of? Look at Umar ibn Khattab. Remember his action. He told them, I am migrating now. I am a Muslim. I adhere to his path, not to your evil paths. What are you going to do? He's challenging them. 
what are you going to do? And no one dared to do anything. This is the path of Islam. This is seeking honor, dignity, might, greatness, and no other than the path of Rasulullah, which is the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another great example, when he was going to Syria, in the company of Abu Ubaidah, another courageous, powerful warrior, excellent companion, the father of the companions. But Umar ibn Khattab, he outweighed, he outweighed the mountains. Abu Ubaidah and him were traveling to Syria. They reached a ford. What's a ford? A shallow part of a river. So Umar ibn Khattab came down from his mount, from his animal that he was riding. So he wanted to cross, so he removed his shoes and placed them on his shoulders and started crossing the, the river. Now Abu Ubaidah, seeing Umar doing such an action, he was shocked. He said, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, O oh, the commander of the faithful, you are doing this? You are the leader, the Amir of the Muslims? How can you do this? I do not want the people in this village seeing you in this state. What did Umar say? Did you see the argument of Abu Ubaidah? Was it in its place? Was it in its place? You know, Abu Ubaidah is rebuking Umar ibn Khattab, this mountain of courage and power, saying, Yeah, Umar, it does not befit you. Being the leader of the Muslims, the commander of the Muslims, the general of the Muslims, the Khalifa of Rasulullah Sallam. How can you do this? This does not befit you, he said to him. What did Umar say? Who knows? Sorry? Close. Hayley? Yes. Before that, what did he say? It's correct, but he said that was his main statement. What was that, Muhammad? Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Do you know what that means? Allahu Akbar. Do you live by that? He said, Ya yeah, Abu Ubaidah. He retorted Abu Ubaidah. Umar what? Retorted. What does retorted mean? Nazfi, you're the dictionary. What does it mean? Replied harshly. Very good. Replied vigorously, harshly, staunchly. He replied in a very aggressive manner, saying to him, Ya Abu Ubaidah, had someone else said what you just said to me, I would have made him an example for all the Muslims. You know, he was known to be a rough person when it comes to the haq. Then he said to him, we were the lowest of people. The lowest, who were pagans, who were mushriks. And then Allah Ta'ala honored us, favored us, blessed us, gave us Islam. He raised us. And then he said his golden statement, Whosoever seeks honor, greatness, might, power, izzah, in other than Islam, he will be humiliated. He will be humiliated. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't Islam beautiful? <laughs> Today, you see people seeking honor and izzah in the straight path, uh, Nazari. Is that correct? Do they seek izzah in the straight path? What do they seek honor and izzah in today? In the dunya? Give me an example of the dunya that they seek izzah in. Yes, in trivial frivolity, garbage, gibberish, uh, ending devilish dunya. And that is why we are today humiliated. Because we have taken the dunya as our way of honor. You know, today you see a lot of Muslims, a lot of Muslims, I've seen this. Like I was at a family in South Africa not long ago and when I was sitting in the 
congregation. His father goes to, he had his children there, a father had his children with him, older people, kids about 20, 25, 24. Come on son, we've got to show ourselves. We've got to be the best of businessmen, the best you know, owners of ABC. We've got to have the most luxurious lights in front of me and in front of a lot of people. We've got to show ourselves that we are the better. Is that correct? Is that correct, Nazari? Is that Izza? So he was trying, or he was wanting, or desiring Izza, honor, boastfulness, greatness, believing that this dunya will give you reputation, recognition, Izza, honor from others. Do we really care what people think if we live in a shape, in a shovel, hut, in a tent? Do you really care if I come today with clothes that are torn, hardly anything to wear or driving, old Volvo? Would you drive a Volvo? Would you drive it? The old ones, would you drive them like 1960 style? Would you drive it? Why not? Yeah? You sure? You sure? Okay, mashallah tabarakallah. But people today think that Izza and the honor is not in driving these things. No, you gotta look affluent. You gotta look great. You gotta look the best. They take Izza as being the most affluent. Wear a suit, a tie. Make sure you're cleanly shaven. Make sure you got your makeup on, smelling good. People will look at you and they'll stand up for you. Stand up for you? Is this the Izza that we have become? No wonder why the Muslims are so degraded today because they have sought, not what Umar sought, not this path, but Uzzah, honor in other than the straight path. Look at Umar Mukhtar. Who knows Umar Mukhtar? Have you heard of Umar Mukhtar? Who is he? Did he liberate him? Uh -huh. Did he liberate him? Yes, that's a better way of saying it. He was the one that was stable and firm when the Italian occupiers tried to steal Libya. He fought the Italian war machine with no more than a SWORD. What's that, Charlie? SWORD. A sword. That's all he fought them with. They caught him at the end. But he kept saying to the occupiers, the Italian evil devils, if your cannons can break my swords, your falsehood will never break my... Huh? <laughs> Truth. Very good. Can you imagine that statement? Your cannons may be able to break my sword, no problem, break them, kill me, torment me, incarcerate me, but your falsehood will never, ever taint, tarnish that which I hold so dearly to whom? To Allah, my faith. It will never, ever change. In fact, it will get stronger. You know, when he was, on, uh, he was about to be hung, they said, we'll free you. We'll free you. Denounce Islam. We'll free you. Because wallahi, if I get freed, I will fight you right now. You free me, I'll fight you. Until the word of Allah is the most high. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. You know, today, you know, there's uh, the judges, the barristers, the lawyers, the prosecutors. The prosecutor come inside your prison cell and will say, you know, between you and me, just say that you're this and that and we'll give you clemency. We'll allow you to go free. You know, just don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. That is belittling yourself. That is disparaging your, your, your Islam, degrading your Islam, humiliating yourself. Stand in his face and say, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar alayk, get lost. This is a Muslim. Am I too harsh? There's many cases. <laughs> you want to have all the cases, my beloved brother. We won't finish till next year. 
there are men that held their ground. Because there are many males out there, and we've said this many times, but not, there are not many men. Many males, but are they real men? And as I said, yes. do it again, it happens to you again. Exactly, and there are many examples. You know, these were the days that those who adhered to this straight path that we are talking about and discussing, they felt that honor and dignity was embedded in their hearts and they did not deviate from this path, no matter what happened. And we all know the Muslim woman that was taken by her, the Romans, a Muslim woman taken prisoner as a captive by a Roman army. And then her famous historical cry, Ya Mu'tasim, who was the Khalifa of the Muslims back then. So when he heard her cry, the honor of one Muslim woman was being harmed. One Muslim woman in Rome by the Roman army. And they were the most powerful army then before Islam. They were the powerful, the most powerful army. So a Muslim woman was taken in and she cried out, Ya Mu'tasim, you are my leader, you are my Khalifa, come and save me. My honor has been attacked. What did Mu'tasim do when he heard about the news? Did he continue, oh, go to sleep with you? He had his night, had a big meal, chicken and lamb, and big nice nasi, big cheesecake after that. I'll fix it, I'll think about it tomorrow. What did he do? Immediately! I am here, ya ukhti! I am here for you. He sent an army in a famous battle called the Amuriyah for the honor that was under attack of one Muslim woman. And he protected that in the Imagine Mu'tasim came today. Look at our brothers and sisters worldwide who are falsely accused and abused, thrown into black prisons, secret prisons, ghost prisons, and other satanic gulag prisons. Are they not? Where they are raped, sodomized, the worst atrocities perpetrated against them, against humanity. Where are the Muslims? What if Al-Muhtasim sees the situation of Palestine? How many years now has Palestine been under this infidelic, evil, devilish stance? Where are the Muslims? How many years do these people, our Muslim brothers and sisters, have to suffer every day? You know, the greatest military generals of all, Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, do we know him? Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi? He was asked by one of his companions, Ya Salah al-Din, Ya Amir, why do you not smile? Like, what's the problem? We'll never see you smile. What did he say? Who knows? He was asked, Ya Salah al-Din, why do you not smile? We never see you smile. He said, how can I smile when Masjid al-Aqsa is under crusade occupation? What did he say? How can I smile when Masjid Al-Aqsa, the third most holiest Masjid on this existence, is under crusade occupation? <laughs> if you came today and saw, Al-Aqsa is not only under Zionist, filthy, dirty Zionist occupation, but 90% of Palestine has been stolen by those filthy Jews leaving them only with two strips. Two strips. Gaza Strip and what? And the West Bank. Two strips. 10% is left of their land. And this was done by brutally and savagely massacring, butchering innocent, weak and defenseless people who fight with rocks. And this was before the eyes of both Muslim and non-Muslim worlds. You know, one of the mayors back then, he was the mayor of Tel Aviv, he actually expressed, wallahi, this is written in their documents, 
to the world. He expressed this mayor of Tel Aviv, the Zionist view of the Palestinian people, quoting his words, he said, we must kill all the Palestinians unless they resign in this place as slaves, living here as slaves. This is his word. This is their belief. And they're getting closer and closer and closer. Look at the settlements in the West Bank. The whole world are against them, yet no one can do a thing. No one is doing a thing. What's this words? So oh, do not do it. We're opposed. We can them. Words going to do anything? This is before the eyes of the world. So that 10% left may not be only 5% sometime soon, or it becomes zero. They've been selling their homes, their occupied homes, they're selling them. Did you hear about that? They're selling their homes. Those who are in refugee camps, and there are approximately 3.5 million Palestinian refugees living in their neighboring countries. Every day, wallahi, they are subjected to verbal and physical abuse. Israeli shelling from above every day. You don't see what is happening out there. Don't listen to that shaitan fox or CNN or BBC. It is devilish. Every single day. And those who remain in Palestine, those who remain in Palestine, they live in the most difficult way of life. The most basic things that a person needs in his life, they find that extremely hard to get. Not even water for them to drink. Every single day, wallahi, they live with constant torture. Fear of being punished, incarcerated or killed every day. And this is happening before the Muslim and non-Muslim world. And instead, you got countries, Muslim countries, that are actually liaising and linking themselves diplomatically or politically with what? With the Israeli shaitan, not the kafar only. That kafar, the, the evilish or the most devilish kafar. Back with Israel directly. Directly. So basically what we've got to understand is, we're not talking about Palestine today. That was just something I added in just due to the topic we're discussing. But Palestine in general is considered holy by all the Muslims. And a land like Jerusalem, where the Aqsa is, belongs to every single Muslim worldwide. It does not belong to the Jews, nor to the Christians. It belongs to the Muslims. And insha'Allah ta'ala, it show the idn al azza wa jal return to the Muslims. Let us go back to our topic. The path of Rasulullah sallallahu In our next coming lessons, insha'Allah, starting from today, we are going to be discussing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his character, who he was, the path that he left us on, that which is known as the Sunnah, and that which is known as Al Bid'ah, and how we should keep away from Al Bid'ah, and we should stick to Al Sunnah, and how the love of the companions was, and why their love was so strong to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we start today by saying in a hadith collected by Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari and Muslim ibn Hijaj on the authority of Anas ibn Malik who said that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said one of you does not believe until I am more dearer to him, more beloved to him than all his children, his father and all people. Now. If we were to study, and whoever has studied the biographies of the courageous, powerful ancestors, the righteous forebears, the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, knows of the profound love that they felt for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It was a love that cannot be matched by the love that a person may have to his parents, his children, or to any person. It was a love 
Not to say I love Rasulullah. No. It was a love that controlled their every emotion. A love that came from the innermost regions of their hearts. This is why the companions, when they heard that this is the path of Rasulullah, they tried their utmost ability to imitate his every action. Every action. So much so where uh, Abdullah ibn Umar, if he knew that Rasulullah went underneath that branch, he would go underneath that branch. Although there was no significance. But because he loved Rasulullah so much and he knew who Rasulullah is and is the way to Jannah and only through him is to Jannah, he tried his utmost ability as they all did to imitate his every action. They were willing, the companions, to even protect Rasulullah with their bodies as human shields. And we know of Nusaybah in Uhud who stood before Rasulullah while the arrows and swords were being driven towards Rasulullah. This lady Mujahida stood before Rasulullah and protected him from all the swords and arrows. They were willing to sacrifice themselves to protect him, not only to protect him as a, as a human being in the sense of his physical character and so forth, no, but his honor, his name. You know, of a Jewish Khabith by the name of Ka'ab ibn Ashraf. You've heard of him? Who's Ka'ab ibn Ashraf? This Jew in Medina, his name was Ka'ab ibn Ashraf. He was extremely avowed an avowed enemy towards Rasulullah. He used to abuse Rasulullah. Not only abuse him, he instigated others to criticize and slander Rasulullah. And then a companion, when he knew that this person, this evil person, is abusing Rasulullah, he executed him immediately. What did he do? He chopped his hair off. And history records that any person who abused Rasulullah, the same punishment was meted out to him. Why? Why is that? Being Muslims, we treat Rasulullah and all prophets with utmost respect. We cannot tolerate willful disgust willful disrespect, insults to any of the prophets to compromise. Yes, sister. Okay, inshallah, we will get to that. We will get to that, inshallah. You're jumping the hurdles. And you jump it very high. Inshallah ta'ala, as we get along, we'll get to it. And if it's not answered, we shall answer it, inshallah. So, we as Muslims cannot compromise in this issue. To compromise in this issue tantamounts to compromising in your faith, your Iman. And we know the hadith of Rasulullah that was collected by Sulaiman ibn al Ash'ath Abu Dawood, who said, No one forsakes the honor of a Muslim, he or she who is under attack except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forsakes that person when he is in most of need. And no one helps a Muslim whose honor and dignity is under attack, except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps that person when he is in most of help. You look at this, brothers and sisters. If a Muslim is not supposed, not supposed to be indifferent when it comes to an ordinary Muslim's honor being attacked. How can we in the world be indifferent when the honor of Muhammad is being attacked? Does it make sense? But here we got to understand, not every single person that attacks Rasulullah do we go and start slaughtering and butchering. No, this is not what I'm saying here. This must be under a correct Islamic court who finds this person as or convicts him for this crime and then he, the judge, the court, takes this perpetrator to his punishment. Not 
every individual that hears the insult, you will find no one on this earth alive no more. Because how much today, or how many people are insulting A'udhu Billahi Rasulullah? This is again another reason why the Muslims are the way they are. Wallahi. They have allowed the kafir to insult us. Insult us is no problem, but insult Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And in the countries that have been doing this, you get other countries, Muslim countries, likewise having ties with them politically. This is absurd. This is ludicrous. This is a shame on us. Wallahi a shame. So the biographies of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam are full of stories that demonstrate extraordinary love and devotion for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. One companion by the name of Khubayb ibn Adi al-Ansari who was captured by the Pekin, Meccan pagans through a sinister and treacherous plot. History records a poem that he said just before he died. They say, as he quotes, they say that they want me to renounce my deen. And if I do so, they will spare my life. But he said, it is better for one to die with belief than to live with disbelief. Do you understand this golden statement? You know, how long are we going to live for, brothers and sisters? Look at the saying of Khubayb. It is better for one to die with belief with Islam than to live in the most luxurious ways with disbelief. And then, just before his death, they said to him, would you not like to be spared and the Rasulullah be in your place? Would you not like to be at home, comfortable, in your dwelling with your family and the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam here and being killed instead of you? What did he say? Did he say yes? Absolutely not. Listen to what he said. He said, Wallahi. And this is now he's being crucified on a cross. They're going to kill him on a cross. And they're nailing the nails on or in his wrist. What did he say? He goes, Wallahi by Allah. I cannot even imagine that a thorn, a thorn prick the foot of Rasulullah well, I rest. In other words, I prefer to die than a thorn prick just the foot of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa See the love they had for the messenger, for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa One of the pagans at the time, Sufyan, who was an unbeliever then, he remarked to his associates, see the love of the companions for Muhammad it is unparalleled and unprecedented. And wallahi, that was true. They loved him more than we ever can love him. They followed him better than we have ever followed him or can ever follow him. They really followed this path of Rasulullah So if you want to understand Islam, look at their life as well. Understand how they lived. Musab ibn Umair, or before that, the courageous words of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. You know Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, Nazri? Have you heard of the companion called Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh? Who is he? That's Mu'adh ibn Jabal. Very good, but sounds the same, doesn't it? Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh was a very powerful, courageous warrior. He was the leader of the Ansar. And as the hadith says, if the throne were to shake for anyone's death, it is for Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. It shook when he died. And if anyone was to be prevented from the, the, the gripping of the grave, it will be Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. Listen to what he said just before the battle of Badr, when he was about to fight a much larger and much better equipped army. He said, Ya Rasulullah, we believe in you. We have affirmed your prophethood. We have pledged our obedience to you. Wallahi, if you were to say to us now, all of us, the Ansar, to jump into the ocean, every single one of us would jump into the ocean. Not one of us will remain behind. Now when he heard this, Rasulullah 
He felt very strong and powerful. He felt happy. Look at the companions, obedience. Look at the love. Look at the adherence to the haq. Look at the unwavering stance. They did not water or compromise out of fear or out of fear of the creation uh, of this earth. This is the way they were, subhanAllah. Musa ibn Umair, another companion. Musa, as a pagan, he was a, a man that he had everything that you can ask for in this life. As a young pagan, he was the best dressed. He was the best cared for youth. He always was clad in the most expensive silk, wore the most expensive perfume, so much so that wherever he went, a trail of fragrance would follow him. Something happened to him in his life. This young lad, young pagan, something happened to him in his life. What happened to him as well? He became Muslim. Something extraordinary happened to him in his life. He met Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he met Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he heard what Rasulullah is saying, extreme love for Rasulullah and for the thing that he came with, which is Islam, penetrated immediately the depths of his heart. His life became a major transformation. His mother, he used to love him to death. She gave him and gave him and gave him because they were rich now began to have extreme hatred for him and despised him and started to punish him severely. It was a transformation from riches, you can say, to, to rags. Rasulullah sallam one day saw him and he was wearing or covering his body up with a patched up old hide. What's a hide? A patched up old hide. Skin of an animal. Covering himself with it. And signs of a rough life has embraced him. Rasulullah looked at him and said, Subhanallah, I saw this young man a few years ago in Mecca. He was at that time the most handsome, the most looked after youth, the one that had everything before him, living in the most luxurious life. He has given all this up, sacrificed all this, for the love of Allah and His Messenger. And he died in the battle of? In the battle of? Uhud. Raising the flag of La ilaha illallah. You know, he was raising the flag with his right hand. A archer came past and sliced his arm off. So he put it to his left hand. And the archer came and sliced that hand off. Could he still raise it? Did he drop it? He did. What did he do? Very good. He closed his shoulders like that and he kept going with the flag of La ilaha illallah. Did not want to drop it until he got killed. And there was not even enough clothes to cover him when he died. It was said they used grass to cover all his body due to his way, the new way of life. Does that mean that we cannot get dressed in good clothes and, you know, live with a bit of luxury in our life? Is that what it means? Does that mean that? But why was he in this state? Sharif, why? Like why his life changed, right? From riches to rags. Does that mean you cannot have a nice car? You cannot have, you know, a nice Merc or BM, a beautiful castle or beautiful attire? Does that mean that? So what happened to him? Sacrificed it. But why did he lose all those things? Who was giving him these things? His mother. It was his mother supporting him. But he sacrificed all this life for Islam. And did not want to go back to that life. Another companion was wearing a gold ring. So Rasulullah saw this gold ring on the companion. He went to the companion, removed his gold ring, and threw it on the ground. He said it is like wearing a burning charcoal from hellfire. Later on, the other companion said to the companion that got the ring thrown away, go pick it up and use it for other legitimate, legitimate purposes. 
and go and grab it, melt it, sell it, whatever. Did he do that? He said, Wallahi, I will never ever touch it once it has been thrown by Rasulullah. See, what we've got to understand here is when a command from Allah and His Prophet comes, don't think twice. Don't think of money or dunya, which one should I choose, this or that. This is the treasure. The command of Allah is the treasure. The command of Rasulullah is the treasure. This is where salvation is. You will get salvation by adhering to call Allah and call Rasulullah. And you will never lose out. And Allah will examine you all. He will examine you all. There are going to come times in your life where a choice will, be have, to, will have to be done or made between something of a dunya and something of Islam. This is an example from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to see what you choose. Don't forget these narrations of Musa ibn Umair, of this companion, of many other stories. Don't choose this dunya over Islam. No matter what you do, don't leave this world with the love of this dunya more than the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you will be with those whom you love on the day of resurrection. Another shining lesson that we can learn is a dialogue between Ar-Rabi'ah ibn, Rabi ibn Ka'ab and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rabi'ah one night stayed with the Prophet sallam at his home. So he brought him water so he can make his wudu. And we know that Rasulullah prayed every, every, every night. The sunnah prayer or the subrogatory prayers at night were an obligation on him. Were they not? The night prayer for Rasulullah was an obligation. Is it for us? But for Rasulullah, yes it is. It was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Rabi'ah Rabi ibn Ka'ab brought him some water. So Rasulullah said to him, Ya Rabi'ah, ask anything you like. What would you like? Because Ya Rasulullah, I only want one thing. Your company in, in Jannah. They don't say I want this beautiful, a beautiful camel, a beautiful house, a beautiful... No. Your company, Ya Rasulullah, in Jannah. Rasulullah looked at him and said, anything other than that? He said, no, Ya Rasulullah, that's all I want, your company. And then he said to him, then help me achieve that for you by devoting yourself often in prostration. See the importance of prayer? See the importance of prayer? Help me achieve that for you to be in my company in the hereafter by devoting yourself, Ya Rabi'ah, often in prostration. Don't ever take prayer lightly, brothers and sisters. Pray as much optional prayer as you can, especially at night, especially to Hajjud, as much as you can. Another great companion was Tawban who loved Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam dearly. One day, he, one day he came to Rasulullah with sadness portrayed all over his face. So Rasulullah, Rasulullah Tarim said, Ya Thawban, what is the problem? He inquired as to why his face is so pale and sad. He said, Ya Rasulullah, and in subhanAllah, see the consideration and the care and the love that Rasulullah had for his companions. See the human touch of Rasulullah to his companions. You know, he inquired about his companions who felt sad, or who looked upset, or depressed, or who were stressed, or if they did not attend the lesson or the masjid, why did they not attend? This connection that he had between them should not go unnoticeable. We should reflect upon this, wallahi. And this is how we should be towards each other. You know, a person, you may see your friend, a close brother or, or close sister, and you see them upset or depressed, but you say, who gives a stuff? You know, I don't care about this person. He can be upset as much as you want. No. This is not a Muslim. It's not the way we are. And how many times do we do this? You know, even our biological brothers and sisters, we may see them upset or something disturbing them, but we don't even care. We don't even think of to go and ask, is there something wrong, akhti or akhi? Or you give a call to your brother, I did not see you in the masjid this morning, why? I did not see you in the lesson, why? Is there anything wrong? Can I help you? Is there a problem? Can I assist you? 
we have lost this ethic, this moral. This is very, very sad. Rasulullah was not like that, Sallam, and he taught his companions not to be like that. They would always ask about each other. Look at Rasulullah, Sallam. When he saw Thawban's face sad and pale, he immediately inquired, Why are Thawban? What is your problem? Are you alright? Has anyone harmed you? Disturbed you? Interfered in your life? Tell me. How can I help you, in other words? Assist you. So Thawban said to him, Ya Rasulullah, it is not that I am sick or I have a disease or anything like that, no. But when our daily meetings come to an end with you, I become lost, very upset, very sad until I see you the next day. See the love they had for Rasulullah And then he said, I remember the hereafter and how you will be in a special place with the other prophets and messengers. And if Allah has destined me to Jannah, I will not see you due to our different degrees in Jannah. And if Allah has destined me to hellfire, I will never ever see you. So Thoban was extremely sad. And Rasulullah, upon hearing this, was silent. Did not know what to say to Thoban. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verse from An-Nisa, verse 69, فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّيقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ وَحَسُنَ أُولَٰئِكَ رَفِيقًا Allah Then he responded to Thawban after Allah revealed to him this verse not knowing before this verse what to say to Thawban who was extremely upset until this verse came down whoever obeys Allah and his messenger then he will be in the company of those who Allah has favored. The prophets, the truthful, the martyrs, and the righteous. And then Allah Ta'ala says, وَحَسُنَ أُولَٰئِكَ رَفِيقًا And what an excellent company that is. Can you get better company than that? Imagine on a day of resurrection being with these people. How can you be with these people? You can tell me. Huh? On the straight path? That's correct. Isn't there in the actual verse, doesn't it say how you can be with these people? It actually says in the verse, whoever obeys Allah and his messenger, then he will be in the company. So it's simple. Wallahi, it's easy, brothers and sisters. Do you not want your Rasulullah to be your friend in Jannah? Your company in Jannah? Your associate in Jannah? And it's not hard. Do you not want to go to Jannah? Then don't love the Jannah of the dunya. There's no Jannah here. Is there a Jannah here, Ashari? Yes, there is. Who takes the Jannah of this dunya? It's a hadith that says there is a Jannah. But for whom? Yes, for the kafar. And it is a sujan, a prison for whom? For the believers. So there is indefinitely Jannah. For whom? For whom? The kafar. Let them have it. Let them take it all. From A to Z. Let them live in their luxuries. Where are they going to end up? Where is Karun? Karun? Harun? Barun? Where are they all? Pharaoh? Where are they all? They're all, Audhu Billah, being punished underneath this earth. And Allahu Musta'an when they are resurrected. Did they enjoy life? They might have enjoyed life. But for how long? How long, brothers and sisters, can you enjoy life for? Do we not understand this? Do we not reflect upon this? Can we not see with our own eyes those that have passed the ancient, who lived in luxuries, who had everything they could ever have? Where are they now? And where are those who lived as righteous people, as Muslims, who sacrificed their dunya for Allah's sake, who loved Allah and Rasulullah more than anything else, and lived in accordance to this adherence? Where are they now? They lived. They lived. But they're two different avenues. We are living still. We have a choice. We're still alive. Make sure you make the right decision before it is too late. The grave is awaiting you 
It could be even being dug for you now, Muhammad. Right now as you speak. Can it? Can it? Look at Afghanistan not long ago. There was a wedding. A wedding. Correct? A young couple. 1920. Prepared. Beautiful dresses. Beautiful attire. Suit. This. That. Expenses. American bomb. Kill them all. You don't know when you're going to die. Well, why? You don't know. The Iranian plane two or three days ago. How many people got killed? 168 people. Did they know they're going to die? A lot of youth on that plane. You don't know when. The one that fell in the ocean. The France or Paris, whatever it was. The Russian one was before after that. The Russian was the Russian. Just in the last month or two, approximately 600. Hundred got killed just because of the plane falling down. Listen, I'm not scaring you off planes and all that. But what I'm telling you is, when your death is destined, your death is going to come. So, they lived. They lived. We are living. They live like us. We're going to die and they're going to be spoken about one day. We're going to be ancient. So make sure before you leave, you adorn your grave. You beautify your grave. You take care of your grave. That is your home. A home that is eternal. It's not like a home that is temporary. You want the best curtains? Yes, you can have it in your grave. A curtain that opens the child to Jannah. You want the best companion? Your companion will be your deeds. So make sure your companion is good deeds and your companion will be good. It's simple. You want the best furniture? Not a problem. Your deeds is your furniture. Brothers and sisters, don't take this life as the only life. Wake up. Alhamdulillah, at least you have the chance to hear how many Muslims out there today now in K.O., in the Twin Tower, in this Bower, Hawa Tower, on the beach, not even adhering to the word of Allah Ta'ala or listening to the admonishment of Allah Ta'ala. Where are they going to end up? Beware and take care of the children. Wallahi ya akhwati al Another companion, inshallah ta'ala, have we got time? We have two board. Plenty of time? Okay, inshallah. It's a bit over time then. It's going to be plenty of time. Another companion by the name of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas. Do we know who his companion is? Who is he? Al Mubashirun bil Jannah. He was given the glad tidings of paradise. Now Sa'ad, he's got a beautiful story of when he embraced Islam. And I'm pretty sure you have all heard of it. When he embraced Islam, his mother, when she heard of his Islam, she flew into a rage. What aeroplane did you fly in? She flew into a rage. Which aeroplane, uh, Hamad? Did they have aeroplanes then? So what do I mean by she flew into a rage? Huh? Yes. She became in a severe state of anger. So she rushed to Rasul to, to Sa'ad, her son. She said to him, what is this religion that you have embraced? Which has taken you away from the religion of your father and mother. Listen to what they said to him then. Wallahi, she said. They believe in God and Allah Ta'ala. Did they not? Because she said in the hadith, by Allah. Do they believe in Allah? This is a pagan talking now. Do they believe in Allah? How, Sister Hayley? So which category of Tawheed did they believe in? Ah, sorry. Which category of Tawheed did they believe in? Huh? Rububiya. That Allah is the only controller, provider of the universe. So they believe that yes, there is Allah, but they committed shirk in which sections? Uluhiya and al or Sifat. So she said to him, how can you embrace a religion that has taken you away from the religion of your father and mother? Wallahi, she said, if you do not forsake your, your new religion, I will not eat or drink until I 
until I die. What did Sa'ad say? Are we allowed to obey our parents in this situation? No, no absolutely not. He said, Ya Ummi, do not do such a thing. For Wallahi, I will never give up my religion for anything. So she carried out her? Her threat, yes, her promise. She stopped eating for days until she became extremely weak. And Sa'ad being a son that loved his mother as every child loves their mother, no matter what she is doing in reality, he kept going back and forth, Ya Ummi, can I get you some water? Can I get you some food? And did she accept it? She persistently refused, saying, No, I will not eat until you leave Islam or I die. But look at what Sa'ad said to her here. He said, Ya Ummi, in spite of my strong love for you, my love for Allah and His Messenger is much, much stronger. And then he said to her a beautiful statement which showed full determination. He said, Ya Ummi, Wallahi, if you had a thousand souls, how many? A thousand souls, and each one were to depart, one after another, I will not give up my religion. Don't waste your time, in other words. Yes, I love you. But your love does come, does comes nowhere near the love for who? For Rasulullah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when she heard this determination and resolve, what did she do, uh, Nasri? Nasri? Did she continue her breakage? She stopped. She stopped? Yes. What she ate? Nasri got in, Nasri got in. Dates, maybe? Yes, cafe, yes. Dates, maybe? She ate dates. Where did you get that from? She had dates, did she? I don't know. Say Allah A'lam. She relented unwillingly and ate and drank. She ate and drank when she heard this strong resolve from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from uh, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas. She said, this person is unbeatable. I am not going to stop him from taking a, uh, abandoning his religion. So she grabbed some food and drank some water. This is the stance of the companions. You can see, subhanAllah, that these companions were not just ordinary people who will just adopt or adhere to anything that is called dunya when it comes to them. Now, it was this incident that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verse in Surah Luqman, verse 13 and 14. Or 14 and 15, sorry. And the end of the verse says, وَإِنْ جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَنْ تُشْرِكَ بِي مَا لَيْسَ بِكِ بِهِ عِلْمٍ مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا If they coerce you or force you, the parents, to commit shirk, in other words, do not adhere or abide or obey them. But in the dunya, Allah says, treat them with kindness. Because they are parents at the end of the day. Now, we ask a question. Why did the companions love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so much? There was no nation on this earth, no group of people that have ever loved their leader or their kin or their teacher as much as the companions loved Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the question is, why did they love him so much? You know, subhanAllah, even a tree trunk, an inanimate creature, loved Rasulullah so much that he could not bear being away from him. Did you know that, uh, Nazvi? Where from? What happened? Uh, was also, um, was good. They made a, a puppet for him. Very good. Bukhari mentions that Rasulullah used to give the sermons next to a tree trunk in the what? In the masjid. One day, the tree trunk was removed from the masjid and placed far from Rasulullah And instead of the tree trunk, what was placed? A, a pulpit. In Arabic, a mimbar. What's the sunnah of a mimbar, brothers and sisters? How should, how many steps of the mimbar should be? Three? 
ما شاء الله ماذا كده فهم؟ ما تنسى له؟ محمد said that very good Muhammad and you exactly right the Sunnah is free according to the Hadith of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. So a pulpit was placed in the masjid where the tree was, the tree removed, and when Rasul الله صلى الله عليه وسلم gave the first sermon on that pulpit, all the people in the masjid heard what? The groaning, the crying of the tree trunk. Is that possible? Do we believe in this? You sure? Maybe it's a weak hadith. Is it a weak hadith? Why not? It's Bukhari. You cannot get a weak hadith from Bukhari. Or can you? Can you? You sure? Is that true? Can Bukhari narrate a weak hadith? Think carefully. Can Bukhari or has Bukhari narrated weak a hadith? He can, but he hasn't. He can, but he hasn't? I want a better answer than that. Huh? Sahih what? You're saying in Sahih al Bukhari, he cannot narrate a Sahih Correct? Very good, Muhammad. In Sahih al Bukhari, there is no weak narrations. But hasn't he got any other books? He's got many other books. Adab al Mufrad. Huh? It's got many weak hadith in it. Why is it in Sahih al Bukhari no weakness? But in the other books there is. Why? Who knows? Because he conditioned in Al-Bukhari only authenticity. But in the other books he did not condition authenticity. He mentioned that I did not place anything in this book, this is Sahih, except that it is Sahih. But the other books he did not say that. He subhanAllah before he placed any narration he would pray two rak'at istikhara, two rak'at, before every hadith. And if he felt comfortable after all the analysis and investigation, he would put it in. He, one day he traveled six months journey to hear a narration that he heard some man had, desert nomad. When he reached that six month journey to the man, he saw him deceiving or cheating or lying to his donkey. So he said, if this man lies to his donkey, he may lie as well to her. He abandoned him, didn't even listen to the hadith and went back home. One year journey. And he didn't even get the hadith. See how strict he was? So you see, the tree trunk started groaning. What did he do after that? When he was on the pulpit, he heard, as they all heard, the groaning of the tree trunk. What did he do, as Nazi? Huh? Very good. He came down from the pulpit, went to the tree trunk, he put his noble, beautiful hand around the tree trunk and he consoled it. He comforted it until the groaning stopped. Allah Wouldn't you like the hand of Rasulullah around you and say, How are you, my beloved follower Nazri Nazvi? Would you like that? How beautiful would that be? Allah. Can that happen? Inshallah ta'ala. I think we shall leave it at that and we shall continue this. It's going to take us about another two or three lessons before we complete this, inshallah ta'ala. And today was just an introduction to this path and we shall, inshallah ta'ala, discuss it in a very in depth analysis and investigation and especially what is the sunnah and what does it mean to go against the sunnah and when is it called a bid'ah and what is bid'ah and is there anything called bid'atu hasana or mubaha and so forth or makruha is there a such a thing we're going to study all that is there something called a good innovation Zaki just to give us something to you know entertain us with there is a good innovation which what's that huh? Aha, Masha, you're a tricky person, aren't you? You're a tricky person, but you're right. <laughs> there is a good innovation when it comes to, huh? not the Islamic side of things, but the linguistic def definition of the bid'ah. I like that one. He didn't say a good innovation in Islam, a good innovation when it comes to. Yes, that's correct. <laughs>
Yes, sister. In other words, if a person is possessed with a black magic, with a tiwala, with a possession by a devilish possession, the jinn and so forth, uh, with a, the evil eye, what do you do in this situation? Well, the hadith does say, whoever is able to assist his friend, his brother or sister, then let him assist. Uh, in other words, if you are able to do our ruqya, the Islamic ruqya, the Islamic incantation, uh, not the incantation of sahr, magic and so forth, which is haram. The correct Islamic incantation, which is the ruqya from the Quran and the Sunnah, then you are advised. Yes, absolutely. And there are specific verses in the Quran and ad'iyah that one can uh, utilize, inshallah, when he exercises the patient. Or you can call him a victim if you want. So, yes, you are allowed to do that. Rasulullah himself did it when he was traveling with Abu Bakr al-Siddiq to a particular destination, a place and a woman was there with her son and his son has been affected by the devil so she said, Ya Rasulullah, my son is affected so Rasulullah grabbed her son and said, A'udhu Billahi Minash Rajim three times and spat in his mouth and then returned the child back to the mother and said to her, meet me when I come back from in this direction inshaAllah ta'ala so when he came back from his travel, the, uh, the lady was there with her son, so he asked her about how the son has fared. She said, Alhamdulillah, Rasulullah has been good ever since what you did. And there are many other examples or hadith, like Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, he done a ruqya on the person that was bitten by a scorpion. And he was a non-Muslim, which even testifies to the fact that not only Muslims can be done ruqya on them, even non-Muslims. In Australia, when I was teaching there, I done a ruqya on a Hindu, an Indian Hindu, and he had a many, many jinn in him. And subhanAllah, after about three sessions with him, he comes up to me, and I was teaching in a chair, on a chair that time, sitting down like this, and there was no one in front of me. I was teaching. And when I teach, I raise my hands and shout and this and that. So as I was teaching, there was no one in front of me. You can tell me why. Was I teaching the gym? Huh? I was sitting down, giving the lecture, and it was a very intense lecture. But there was no one in front of me. Wallahi, there was no one in front of me. So how can that be? Huh? There was no camera. I was giving a lesson, but there was no one in front of me. Sisters. So we're in another area. <laughs> so the, this young guy that I was possessed, and I was being recited over, he comes up the staircase, and he just looks at me. What the heck is he doing? He could see no one in front of me, and I'm yelling and shouting and doing this and, you know, doing a lecture. So he looked at me, he got scared for a second there. Like, he was in doubt. Should I come? Should I go and see this guy? He looks like he needs a recital. You know, he thought, I needed a recital. So he comes up anyway, and slowly he's looking at me as I'm talking, and then I stop, said, brother, come in. It's okay. I'm talking to people inside that room. Oh, okay. So he sat next to me and he said to me after the lesson I was given, he goes, thank you very much, sir. He's not a Muslim, but I have never ever slept as I've been sleeping since you've done the ruqya. He goes, I feel nothing affecting me or interfering in my sleep since you have done the ruqya on me. And that person then started following Islam up. And I don't know what happened because I left. But I left him with the boys in GRYC, the Global Islamic Youth Centre. But yes, you can do it to Muslim and non-Muslim. In fact, the non-Muslim, you see a lot of bizarre things when you do the rookie on them. There are more sort of, you know, weird experiences than that of a Muslim's rookie. Sorry? Are you allowed to utilize the assistance of the gym? Yes. 
absolutely not. You are not allowed to utilize the jinn in order to assist you in your ruqya. So much so it could reach shirk. So you got to be very careful of assisting yourself with anything or anyone but who? Allah Ta'ala. Now I'm here as Tez Nazvi. Yes. What do we do? Do we rise up or do we... First of all, you utilize your ability. And Allah Ta'ala says, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها Allah does not burden you beyond your, your capability. You know what you are capable of. Financially, supporting them. A lot of dua and there is definitely the ability there. Do never ever underestimate the dua. Wallahi, never underestimate the dua. Always use it as a shield and as power. For wallahi, Allah hears it, sees it, and can easily respond to it. And you will get rewarded for it. The dua is the most important thing. Financially, a system. There are many orphans there, many families that cannot eat or drink. Look, search, see what you can do, what your ability is. If you're a doctor, for example, huh? you can assist them in your, in your profession. If you're a teacher and they need help, assist them in your teaching. There are many things you can do, physically huh? and verbally. <coughs> And I hope you understand what I mean. Naam, ya Hamad, ya Habibi, ya Azizi. Is savings and courage in Islam and Islam? Is when Rasulullah asked Abu Bakr, "You give everything, how much? You have how much invest? Is saving something that is Islamic, or you know, are we giving the blessing to Allah?" Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiyallahu ta'ala anhu was a very very rich man as we all know. One day Umar ibn al-Khattab said I am going to defeat Abu Bakr uh, and give more in sadaqah. So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq at that time had planned to give his entire wealth in sadaqah to Islam. Umar ibn al-Khattab thought it's going to be better than him today so he decided to give how much? A quarter or three or two thirds? Half of his wealth. So he got half of his wealth, went to Rasulullah and said, Ya Rasulullah, today I have beaten Abu Bakr. Did he beat him? Absolutely not. He said, you have not beaten him. He has given all his wealth, he said, in there. And he said, I will never ever beat Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. Yes. Now Abu Qahafa is who? His? His father. Abu Qahafa is Abu Bakr as-Siddiq's father. He was a kafir at that time. Was he a Catholic Muslim after that? Yes. So he went to the house of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. He was a blind man. He went there and who was there? What's her name? Aisha or, uh, or Umm Kalfum? What was Abu Bakr's name? daughter's name? The one that was in the room? Well, it could be Maimuna, it could be Rukaya, wasn't it? Asma was in there. So Asma was in the house and he said, Ya Asma, I heard Abu Bakr has given all the wealth and left you with nothing. He was saying that? Abu Quhafa, the father of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. She said, No, Ya Abba, Ya Abati. She did not want him to think like that because he was extremely angry. So she put, there was a bag of like little rocks. She goes, Come, I'll show you where the money is. She made him touch that. So he thought, oh, Okay then, that the money was not all donated to Islam and that yes, he has left something for his children. But when Rasulullah asked, Ya Abu Bakr, what have you left for your family? What did he say? I left him a beautiful home, beautiful car, beautiful clothes, beautiful beach, beautiful resort, a house on the, you know, in Washington DC. Is that what he said to him? What did he say? I have left Allah wa Rasuluhu for him. What does that mean? How can you leave Allah and Rasul, Rasulullah for them? How? Huh? He was mutawakkil, but there's something better than that. Like how could he have left Allah wa Rasulullah? What is the meaning of that? Oh, 
Okay, he has left the teachings, the faith, the taqwa of Islam, which is sufficient for them. The belief, the love, the trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Allah and His Messenger. Did Abu Kahafa embrace Islam? Yes, he did. So much so that he had snow white hair, a beard and hair, snow white. So what happened then? When Rasulullah saw Abu Kahafa with snow white hair, the father of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, what did he say? Could go and dye it with blonde hair or dark green hair or dark or fluorescent yellow? Which one? He said don't dye it like the kafar? Dye it to be not like the Jews. Where did you get that from? Is that Nazvi's collection? Of Nazvi? Okay. <laughs> what, did he, what did he tell him to dye it with? Huh? Black? Black, Black henna, was it? Oh, that's a major, major problem there. That is an innovation and a half, Nasri. He told them, go and change the color of his hair with henna. That's a specific color like red. And he said here, and avoid the, the black. And this is with a prohibition that you are not allowed, woman or man, to dye your hair, bead hair, with the color black. It is haram in Islam. Why is it haram, do you think? Could, be a, could there be a reason for this? Huh? Yes, it can deceive the other person. You know how many men dye their hair black and they could be 60 years old? But when they dye their hair fully black, they can look 40 years old. Did you know that? Black makes you look younger. It's a deceiver in reality when you dye your hair from white or any other color to dark black. It actually changes the age, the look in the sense how old you are. And this is haram in Islam. You cannot deceive the other. And many, many men have done this and I've heard of this. When they go to meet their potential wife, they dye the whites or the grays of their hair. Why do that for? Why deceive this woman? She may think you're 10, 20 years younger by looking at you like this. So it is haram in Islam, regardless of the reason, to dye your hair black. And the correct opinion here is male and female. So what was the question, Muhammad? Are we allowed to save? Yes, of course you're allowed to save. There's no problem in saving money. But how much are you allowed to write in your will if you leave any money behind? As long as the money is lawful, and you're saving or accumulating lawful earnings, it is no problem. But how much are you allowed to give as charity in your will? One fourth? One third. You can give one third of your wealth only. The other two thirds go to where? Go to who? Your animals, your family. Or some, there's a lady in Australia who, in her will, I think it was $50 million it was, gave it to her dog. Wallahi! Look how stupid and silly people are. To a dog? And you'll see this in the world, everywhere in the world it's happening today. So you are allowed to give only a third. So yes, you are allowed to save, Ya Muhammad, but that saving must be lawful. Huh? Not built on the riba from the bank or on haram from selling drugs or alcohol. No. Lawful savings is acceptable, but be careful that you don't leave much behind. I strongly urge that the money that you have, give as much as you can while you are alive. Fi sabirillah. Wallahi. Even if you've got a beautiful mansion, give it to as waqf. Make it an orphanage, for example. Sell it and make that money before you die. Fi sabirillah. But you cannot do it on your deathbed. You gotta do it while you're still alive and healthy. You understand what I'm saying here? Like you know how many people do <laughs> when they are about to die and they know they're gonna they're suffering from a chronic, you know, deadly disease, and they're on their beds, they can cark at any second. What do they do? Write this to this person and that person and that person and so this. They wanna make the best of it. They cannot do that. Islamically it's haram. You are only allowed to execute at that time one third of your money. 
Do you understand this? Any other questions? Or you've all had enough? Discrepancies, differences, contradictions, conflict, problems, issues. Yes. No, so much, sorry? So much, uh, I mean, like, What is the correct stand? Yes. Only one stand. I've said it earlier on. This is the stand. I'll explain it to you. This is the stand. Okay. You got a good argument there, a good issue that you have, you know, presented. Basically, we're going to have many differences in Islam. This person says, Mawlid al-Rasul must be performed. These people say, Awwadu billah, it's an innovation. These people attack this group saying, you're a Wahhabi because you don't celebrate the Prophet's birthday. These are saying, no, no, you're a Muqtadiyah. You're an innovator. You're committing innovation. What do we do? No matter where they're from, Saudi, Egypt, Mauritania, whatever. The issue is not where they're from. The issue is what's being spoken about. A clear verse in the Quran says what? وَإِن تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَلُدُّوهُ إِلَى مَنْ إِلَى إِلَى اللَّهِ when you differ amongst yourself in anything, return it back to whom? To Allah and Rasulullah. Okay. Let us hear this argument from this side. They say, Maud Rasul is an obligation, sign of love for Rasulullah. It's an act of worship. But in Islam, we know that every act of worship must be brought on what? Every act of worship. And we're going to learn this, inshallah. We'll be studying this coming, inshallah, in our coming lessons. But every act of worship must be in accordance to what? Yes. So we ask ourselves, this group, where did you get it from? They refer you back to some from the Fatimiyya time. That it was a resemblance of Isa alayhi salam's birthday, Christmas. That's the essence of it, in a nutshell, in a nutshell. So they say, we have more right to our messenger our prophet than they have. This is, just, this is silly of them to even say that. So they have introduced this act of worship due to their opinion, their thought, their intellect. They have put their intellect above the nakal, the Islamic uh, creed, the Quran and Sunnah. That's their argument in a nutshell. And there's much more to it in a nutshell. The other group is saying, hold on. We are Muslims that adhere to them other than the path of Islam. And the path of Islam is what? The Quran and Sunnah. Did Rasulullah do this? No. Did Ashab al-Rasul, the companions, do this? We don't find anything. Did the Tabi'in do this? No, we find nothing as well. The first three generations, did they do this? No. Did they not love him more than we loved him? So if you want to be on the haqq, just in a nutshell, huh? which is more stronger to you? Irregardless of who said it, huh? where they said it. Purity of what? what? Now after this argument, which one would you accept? To perform the mawlid or not to perform it? Why? Exactly. So every single issue in Islam this is the way you judge it. This is the way you look at things. Any argument among scholars. There's no such thing as saying, no, 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 I'm going to blindly follow this shaykh. Or no, no, I believe this shaykh is more higher. Follow the haqq. Listen to the arguments. See which is more closer, more authentic, in accordance to his way. And follow that way. 
and you'll never ever go wrong. Wallahi. But when you do something he did not do, obviously it could be a big mistake there. You've deviated. And we show thoroughly take that in our coming lessons, inshallah ta'ala. Is that understood? Do you still have that problem with confusion? Alhamdulillah. <laughs> May Allah reward you both and place you both in our fardos insha'Allah ta'ala and all of us insha'Allah ta'ala. Any other questions before we leave? Naam ya ukhti. Sister Ernie, I can't hear you. On? Riba, go for it. I couldn't hear it, I only heard three quarters of it. It's not your fault, it's my hearing. In other words, let me clarify and see if I understood it correctly. I go and buy a car for 2,000 ringgit, correct? And I sell it for 4,000 ringgit. Is this allowed? Absolutely. This is tijara now. You are allowed to do that. You have every single right. Otherwise, there will be no such thing as trade. No one can trade. This is the essence of trade. You are allowed to do that. So there's no riba connection here whatsoever. You are, and you are doing nothing but being a merchant, dealing with commodity. You buy something and you sell it for a higher price. You can do that, there's no problem there. Is that what you meant? Okay, so. How much? Sorry? <laughs> it depends in reality on the actual uh, the, the merchandise. When, it, when you look at apples and oranges, for example, you are not allowed in the market to destroy the market in Islam. For example. The market sells for a kilo of apples, say six, six ringgit. You cannot come now every single day and start selling apples for one ringgit. That's not Islamic. It's actually haram. Why is that? Because you're destroying the market. You got to give the closeness or the news of that common value of that product. But when it comes to cars and stuff like that, it's another issue altogether. See, everything's got its stance. If I got a car that is worth 15,000 ringgit, I bought it for 5,000 ringgit, but it's worth 15,000 ringgit. I can sell it for 30,000 ringgit if I want. But it's worth only 5,000. I'll give you a beautiful narration. There was a, a companion of Rasulullah and he sent his slave, his servant, to buy him a horse. Now. When the servant reached the merchant and said, I want to buy your horse off you, how much do you want for it? The merchant said, I want 300 dirham. How much? 300 dirham. The currency was then dirham or dinar. So the servant agreed and the seller agreed. They agreed on that price. The servant said, Come with me and get or receive your money and drop the merchandise, the horse. When the companion, I think his name was Jari ibn Abdullah, I can't remember in, in, in accuracy. When the companion saw the horse, he looked at it, he said, I offer, I offer, would, you, would you accept it for 400 dirham? Now the deal has been done, listen carefully. What's happened? The deal has been done. He goes, would you accept it for 400 dirham? So that was a bit sort of like estranged as I just sold it to your servant for 300. You're saying, would you give it to me for 400? Like it, it doesn't make sense. It's not logical in reality. He said, yes, I do accept. Then the companion said, would you sell it for 500 dirham? This guy, this seller, he was a bit sort of, you know, shocked. What is he talking about? <laughs> you know, he's a very good buyer, isn't he? I wish there was more of them around. So he said, yes, of course I accept it. 
would you accept it for 600? It reached up to, I think, 800 dirham. And the seller obviously said, yes, of course I accept it. He received two and a bit more than he wanted for his horse. And he went happy, laughing, joking. So the companion was asked as to why he did that. He goes, because I know how much that horse is deserves and is worth. He does not know. And I wanted to give him the real value of that horse. This is Islam. See the haq of Islam. See the Muslim's attitude when it comes to commerce, economics, merchandise, commodity, sales, trade. Not playing with the measure and weight, as we mentioned before in our lessons. This companion knew the correct and accurate value of this horse, and the seller did not, so he gave him the value of that horse. Not under, not over. Exactly what he believed it was worth. I think he said that he said that That is a narration, the end of it, that none of you believe until he loves for his brother that which he loves for himself. See, the hadith there clarifies that every Muslim is just, is fair. He does not play with the weight, the measure. He knows something is worth more than that. He is allowed to offer, and it's better, because this person could be ignorant, and he could lose. Likewise, the other way around, the same scenario. Do you understand this example? So, this is Islam. It is beautiful. Imagine every single Muslim uh, did that and live like that with each other? Wallahi, we'll be like this and so powerful. But no, the brother sells you a car. Sorry, sister, I'll come in a sec. The brother sells you a Volvo, again, saying that it's absolutely mint. You know what mint means? Not the mint that you eat, the na'na. -na. The Arabic word for mint is na'na. -na. You know what na'na -na is? No Arabs here? Are we all Muslims? So we have to be Arabs, don't we? Are we Arabic speaking? No, no. Okay. Na'na -na is mint. And mint is not what I'm referring here. The car was absolutely mint. What does mint mean here to me? Absolutely uh, immaculate. Excellent condition. He says to the buyer, it is beautiful. It is 100%. And he knows that that engine has a failure in it, has a problem in it. And he sells it uh, by deceiving this person. This is happening amongst the Muslim population today. They are cheating and deceiving each other. And the hadith clearly says, Man ghasha, falaysa, minna. Whoever cheats us is not from us. Whoever deceives us is not from us. Whoever burgles us is not from us. In other words. And this is what we are witnessing sadly to say today. Wallahi, if we hold together and put the trust in each other, and we're fair and just to each other. No one has the power to ever dent us, to harm us, because of our strength that we hold and the bond that we hold. Yes, sister. You've been living, sorry? In are we living in the days of fitna? Uh huh. Well, the hadith does say that a time will come where a man will flee with his family to the top of a hill out of fear of losing his deen. This has come already. This can refer to as well as migration from one land to another. Likewise, a narration says that a time will come and to follow Islam as it should be followed is like holding a burning charcoal in an ember a burning ember, it's like holding that, and that is our time as well. Because of our afflictions and the tribulations, the trials that has become in this era is very, very strong. Look at the computer, the internet, look at the television. Wallahi, be careful. The internet is dangerous. Be careful. The television is dangerous. Be careful. The cinema is dangerous. Be careful. The magazines are dangerous. Be careful. The newspapers are dangerous. Be careful. People are very dangerous. And this is the time that we are living in. We are living in an era of danger. 
We are living in an era of examination and tribulation. We are living in an era, era where the good is looked at as bad and the bad is looked at as good. And this we have been warned against. And there is an actual narration that says that what do I do here, Rasulullah, when there's so much fitna and there's no leader, no imam to be followed, no khalifa? He said, stick to Islam even though you're by yourself. What in reality we should understand from these narrations is, if you find yourself in a place that is affecting you Islamically, that you are losing your deen, or you are unable to perfect your deen, or strengthen your taqwa, or your iman, or the surrounding that you are living in is degenerating your Islam, you are obliged to leave that place. You know what I mean by obliged? It's a worship here, an absolute obligation. You are not allowed to remain, whether it's a country, whether it's a land, anywhere, a suburb, a village, anywhere that you are confronted with the devil where you are unable to fulfill the rights of Islam. There and then you must look for an alternative. So this is what you do, inshallah. You know, what I'll do if I was in your shoes, if I had the same problem, I'm not saying you in particular, but if I was in a person where, if I was a person who has a major issue in trying to perfect his deen, and I cannot increase my iman, and my iman is decreasing, and my family is affected, I'll look at my situation I'm living in. I'll look why, what is the problem that this is you know, from? What is causing this? Have I got a television at home? Are the kids watching television? Have I got an internet? Are we looking at the internet and just allowing ourselves to go on it whenever, however, in whatever? Are we going anywhere and everywhere, whether it's the pyramids, to the mines, whether it's this place or that mall, where there's nothing but shaitan? Are we talking to anyone? We're allowing our children to talk to anyone, how they want, when they want. No at all restriction. Are we allowing our wives to watch, to look, to talk, to anything and everyone? Are we allowing ourselves as men, likewise, to go and talk to every single Muslim woman that is not mahram to us or non-mahram to us? You've got to look into your own actions and see what is the problem in your family. What is the disease and the sickness that is in your family? Change it! Don't leave it. That's the, oh, another problem, but you let it go. Today, television, wallahi, it's satanic. Even the cartoons. You know, I watched one day, not long ago, just to see what is on there. It was a Japanese cartoon. What do they call it? Huh? Animation. Not, whatever it's called. But, a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim is there anything on it but sexual promiscuity? Flirting, girlfriend, boyfriend, nudity, even though the animation, it's too effective. The kids are learning this. I put it on another channel, which was Disney, nothing but fairy tales, princesses, kings, uh, uh, you know, magic and sorcery. This is very dangerous, wallahi. Wallahi, and this is what the children are watching day after day. Don't take this lightly. Make sure you do not allow that screen, that satanic screen, be the babysitter of the house. For this is exactly what it is today, the babysitter. You get tired of your child, you just put the video, a DVD for him or whatever, or the Astro, and you just throw him there, Music, singing, lyrics, devil, who cares? You have no problem in the world. And yet you expect her or him to be like an angel after that. How in the world can he or, be, he or she, a little flower, a little rose, how is she ever going to be in the right direction if you are giving them the curves? Don't forget those curves. They are for your children as well. Don't live a house of curves. Live a house of istikama, a straight path. So you got to look at your own life. Your own life. And make sure that your own life 
is in accordance to the straight path. If this television is in your house and your children are obsessed by it, remove it. Remove Astro, remove the antenna, put a DVD, but make sure they watch only that which is Islamic. It's hard, isn't it, Nazvi? It is, isn't it? It's easy to say, but it's very hard to do. Correct? Are you obsessed by television? Alhamdulillah. Are you children? Alhamdulillah. But if you are obsessed, you'll be in big trouble. Big trouble. When? Later on. And how many wives, wallahi, 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 this is in Australia, have called me only due to this their, their watching of things like days of our life, wallahi, the bold and the beautiful, other shaitan films that have these daily like series, huh? all about love and this husband stole this <coughs> other wife's husband, wife and this hus wife stole her husband, yeah, crap after crap. And she's sitting there and crying and feels remorse and remorse about these people and how upset this person's become because her husband's been stolen or his wife has been stolen and she sits there with a tissue and yet she applies this in her own life and this is where the danger hits don't take these lightly wallahi it's not light it is in, it is intense and severe and this is destroying a lot of marriages so i warn you and i warn you be careful of the Satan in your house. For when you allow Satan in your house, you have allowed Americanization in your house. Americanization. And I say Americanization because the majority of what is on that crap is American related. Kavich? Alhamdulillah. Is that understood? I hope that's just slightly answered your question. So you can take the TV out your house now? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. We can talk about this till the day that we die. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us or envelop us with His blessings and mercy and forgive us our shortcomings. And may He make us all, inshallah ta'ala, those who ignite La ilaha illallah. For there are many out there that are trying to extinguish La ilaha illallah. And may He make our children uh, bearers of the light of La ilaha illallah. Wallahi. You teach your children now and the flag of Islam will not be trampled in the future. The generation of Islam are in our youth insha'Allah. And we need this youth. Islam needs this youth. We need to strengthen our youth. Why? To raise the flag of no other than La ilaha illallah. And they insha'Allah will not allow anyone to trample over it. How can you do that? By raising your children correctly. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for our sins. أقول ما تسمعون والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين How long brothers and sisters can you enjoy life for? Do we not understand this? Do we not reflect upon this? Can we not see with our own eyes? Those that have passed the ancient, who lived in luxuries, who had everything they could ever have, where are they now? And where are those who lived as righteous people, as Muslims, who sacrificed their dunya for Allah's sake, who loved Allah and Rasulullah more than anything else, and lived in accordance to this adherence? Where are they now? They lived. They lived. They're two different avenues. We are living still. We have a choice. We're still alive. Make sure you make the right 
decision before it is too late.